Seminary of California. Thank you for the, those who are joining us online as well. This is the first of three days where we have a distinguished lecturer joining us to deliver the Robert G. and Nellie B. Dendulk Lectures on Pastoral Ministry. Just to introduce you to this lecture series, about 30 years ago, 1993 in particular, upon the retirement of Robert Dendulk, both the Friends of the Seminary as well as the Dendulks endowed this particular lectureship to bring experienced and distinguished pastors on campus so that they can help us think through both the rigors and joys of pastoral ministry. And we've been delighted for nearly 30 years to have various individuals join us to be able to share with us their wisdom and experience. And this morning, and for the next three days, it's no different. But before I introduce our uh, speaker for this morning and for the next three days, I, wanna, I wanna ask all of you to rise together and turn with me to the Red Trinity Hymnal, 559. All the verses will be sung together as we begin this morning. Please be seated. I'm going to make a note to myself to learn the song that I lead uh, next time before we lead it. Well, this morning I have the privilege of introducing to you our speaker. Reverend Ted Hamilton is the pastor of New Life Presbyterian Church here in Escondido, where he's been pastoring for 20 plus years. And you can see the title reflecting the longevity of his pastorate here. He graduated from Stanford University, which is a small university with a weak basketball team up in Northern California. And upon graduating from Stanford, he also went through the law program there, receiving his JD and soon after joining O'Melveny and Myers and practicing corporate and tax law there for 14 years, the last five as one of the partners. Why he did so, perhaps he might explain to us as well, but what he did do was to spend the last three years traveling down here from South Orange County to actually get educated here. I'm told that he was memorizing his language cards while driving, which made his wife Linda very nervous in terms of his drive back and forth. But having finished his degree here in 2000, in 2001, right around September 11th, he actually became senior pastor at New Life Church here and Escondido. He has taught for us at various stages. He has also served as an at-large board member for Westminster Seminary, California. He is a dear friend to the seminary. 
And for my family in particular, we're privileged to sit under his care and um, preaching as well. And so we're delighted to have him here. But perhaps the most important part of his biography is that he's married to his wife, Linda, who joins us this morning, have two kids, Sarah and Jim. And Jim, their son, is a graduate of our institution as well. And now with them, four grandchildren. We are so delighted to have you here with us, Ted, to speak to us and share with us your wisdom under the title, Is the Local Church Too Small a Thing for You? Which I think is a very challenging question with the subtitle, The Impact and Challenges of Dedicated Service to One Congregation. This morning's lecture is titled, Pastoral Excellence and Humility. Ted, welcome. Please bring us the word this morning. Let's welcome him warmly. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, Joel, and uh, good morning to you all. It's good to be with you. Um, before we start, let me open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together in uh, the name of Jesus to consider uh, the work of your church and, and in particular the work of the pastor. And we pray, Father, that your spirit would bless our time, that it would be um, an encouragement to uh, the students, um, and it would um, uh, be to your glory uh, and to the glory of your church and your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is a pleasure uh, to be with you uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to be looking at three topics over the next three days. Uh, and, for today, sort of how the pursuit of excellence in ministry intersects with humility. Uh, tomorrow, how the, the idea of leadership, the, which is something you're going to do as a pastor, how that intersects with humility. And then finally, congregational life, how, you, how your life with your congregation also intersects uh, with humility. Um, a man I've read with great profit over the years is the late pastor and professor Eugene Peterson. Uh, he once said, uh, and I'm quoting now, being a pastor is an incredibly good, wonderful work. It's one of the few places in our society where you can live a creative life. You live at the intersection of grace and mercy and sin and salvation. We have frontline seats and sometimes we even get to be part of the action. Well, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, Peterson's assessment of the pastoral calling, and so as one working pastor to other working pastors and to future pastors, I hope uh, in these lectures I am able to, in some small way, encourage you uh, in this calling. Um, and, um, you know, restore, if you've lost it, uh, the joy uh, of your calling. These aren't going to be academic lectures. Uh, you're, you get better ones from your professors. Uh, consider these lectures more like notes from the battlefield, okay? Pastoring is organic work, right? And being organic work, that means it's almost always slow. Uh, Wendell Berry wrote a poem uh, entitled Stay Home, uh, where there is a line that describes farming that I think also pretty well describes the pastoring life. Uh, Berry writes, in the labor of the fields longer than a man's life, I am at home. In the labor of the fields longer than a man's life, I am at home. Uh, that's a pretty good description of uh, where we are at home as pastors, uh, working in fields longer than a man's life. As pastors, you and I are playing uh, the long game. Uh, one of my colleagues at New Life uh, likes to say, and I forget where he got the quote, that pastoring is like planting sequoias. And I think he's right. So if pastoring is this organic work, which is typically slow and long, then why are pastoral tenures in our country uh, so comparatively short? 
if my informal research is accurate, uh, the average tenure of a lead pastor in the United States is anywhere between four and seven years. Now maybe that sounds like a long time to some of you, but I would argue that in four to seven years of pastoring, you're just getting your feet on the ground as a pastor. There are certainly a number of reasons for this phenomenon of uh, short-term pastorates, but for these lectures, I want to focus on just one, and I would call it selfish ambition or sinful ambition. Now, that may sound unkind to you. Uh, That may sound stark to you. You may think it doesn't apply to you. Uh, Maybe it doesn't. It applies to me. I can assure you that I am not finger-pointing here. Uh, Sin-fueled ambition is something that uh, uh, is in my heart and something that I fight against. Uh, I've always wanted to be a pastor of a megachurch. And not so much for, for the glory of Jesus, but for my own vindication. So at best, I'm a fellow struggler with those of you who may also uh, see sinful ambition rearing its head in your own heart and life. Uh, To open up this topic, what I want to do is uh, look at the first part of Numbers, chapter 16. I'm not really going to be exegeting this passage, but we're going to look at it because I want you to see the problem of sinful ambition in ministry Uh, as Moses identified it and dealt with it in in the context of that event which uh, has come to be known as Korah's Rebellion. Okay? 16 uh, verses 1 through 11. Now Korah, the son of uh, Itzar, son of Koat, son of Levi, and Datan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Pelet, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, you've gone too far, for all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? When Moses heard it, he fell on his face, and he said to Korah and all his company, In the morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will bring him near to him. The one whom he chooses he will bring near to him. Do this, take censers, Korah and all his company, put fire in them and put incense on them before the Lord tomorrow, and the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the holy one. You have gone too far, sons of Levi. And Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it too small a thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister to them and that he has brought you near him and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you? And would you seek the priesthood also? Therefore, it is against the Lord that you and all your company have gathered together. What is Aaron that you grumble against him? Well, of course, you know how this uh, event ends. Korah and his company, along with their families, are executed uh, by the Lord. It's a sobering event, and it's a rebellion within the people of God that's rooted essentially in what we're talking about today, which is selfish ambition in ministry. Korah was envious of Moses and Aaron and wanted to do more in ministry than he was currently assigned to do. from verse 9 of this text, of course, that I got the title for this lecture series as the local church, Too Small a Thing for You. For Korah, a Levite, it 
his ministry was too small a thing for him, right? To do service in the Lord's tabernacle, to stand before the congregation, to minister to them. He apparently wanted to be more noticed, have more influence among God's people. My question is, do you? Sometimes I do. So my working thesis is that one of the reasons many pastors don't stay long in their pastorates is the Korah factor. That they're looking to be more noticed, more influential than they think they can be where they are. And I want to unpack this thesis under three headings. First, the problem. Second, the tension. And then third, the correction. So it's the problem, the tension, and the correction. Uh, first, the problem. Uh, not surprisingly, it, it comes down to that three-letter letter word, sin. There are, there's, there's sin at two levels here, right? There's our deeply entrenched heart-level sin, and then there's our sin-shaped cultural values uh, which we individually as pastors and collectively as a church sometimes unconsciously, sometimes consciously absorb those sin-shaped cultural values. Well, the, the heart-level sin problem is, is described clearly in the Proverbs. Proverbs 25, 27, it is not good to eat much honey nor is it glorious to seek one's own glory. Proverbs 27, 2. Let another praise you, not your own mouth. A stranger, not your own lips. And then, of course, Jesus, uh, in his Sermon on the Mount, deals with it as well. Matthew 6, 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Apostle Paul identifies this pride of heart in actual Christian preachers who are taking advantage of the fact that he's in prison. Philippians 1, 15 through 17. Uh, Paul says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. There Paul is, is saying quite clearly that we can do a good thing, proclaim Christ, for a bad reason, for our own selfish ambition. So this biblical data confirms what I already know about my heart, what you probably already know about your heart. That that it is uh, that my pro, uh, that it, my heart can be prideful. It is often selfishly ambitious. It seeks its own glory. And this sin sinful inclination of our hearts is then magnified by the second level of sin, which is outside of us. The, the sin shaped cultural values that we uh, that are floating in the air that we breathe and we suck in and we we become conformed to. That cultural narrative affirms that it's a good thing to make a name for yourself. You need to make a name for yourself. That you need to establish a brand, expand your reach, increase your followers. The cultural narrative insists that bigger is better than smaller, that more is better than less, that to be published is better than to be not published that speaking at regional or national or international conferences is more influential than what you do in your local church. That productivity is king. And the reality is all of these things are measured numerically. It's kind of a, if I can use the, a shorthand, uh, Reference it, it's it's kind of a celebrity culture uh, within the church, and your value as a pastor uh, 
is directly related. It goes up and down uh, according to your celebrity quotient based on those cultural values. I commend Christianity Today uh, for its recent podcast series entitled The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. I suspect a number of you uh, listened to that podcast. It was well done. I thought it was remarkably well done, though not without its faults. Uh, For me, as I listened to it, I would usually listen to it as I was doing my exercising, um, I sometimes it felt a bit voyeuristic. Um, I, I, I was a little uncomfortable, and sometimes I was convicted because it was appealing to that sinful part of me that um, celebrates the downfall of another, which is ugly. That says a lot more about Christianity today, or about me, than it does about Christianity today or about Mark Driscoll. Um, Mark Driscoll is in in many ways an easy target for criticism, Uh, but the fact is, and the convicting truth, is that, that Driscoll unabashedly reinforced goals and values that I, as a pastor, am also drawn to. Listen to this excerpt from a sermon preached by Mark Driscoll in 2006. That's eight years before uh, he abandoned the the, uh, disciplinary process he was under and and quit the church. Here's the quote. This is from a sermon. I'm a guy who is highly competitive. Every year I want the church to grow. I want my knowledge to grow. I want my influence to grow. I want our staff to grow. I want our church plants to grow. I want everything because I want to win. I don't want to be just where I'm at. I don't want anything to just be where it's at. And so for me, it is success and drivenness and it's productivity and it's victory that drives me constantly. That's my own little idol and it works well in a church because no one would ever yell at you for being a Christian that produces results. So I found the perfect place to hide. And I was thinking about it this week. What if the church stopped growing? What if we shrunk? What if everything fell apart? What if half the staff left? Would I still worship Jesus? Or would I be a total despairing mess? I don't know. By God's grace, I won't have to find out, but you never know. Well, he found out. But before you cast a stone at Driscoll... Uh, examine your own heart to consider how much you may share his values, though you may be, or you're almost certainly better at hiding it than Mark Driscoll is. Listen, if I'm honest with you guys, if I haven't said what Mark Driscoll said, I can tell you for sure that I've thought it. I want the same things. I, I want my church to grow. I want my knowledge to grow. I want my influence to grow. I want my staff to grow. I want our church plans to grow. I want those same things. And that, you know, and those in things in and of themselves aren't problematic except that if, if it was, if those things were desired to promote the glory of Jesus, but very often it's more about promoting the glory of Ted, vindicating his leadership, his gifts. Now, so as uh, convicting and as troubling as the portrait of Driscoll was in that podcast series, I was actually, I came away from that podcast actually more troubled by the fact that Christian leaders Uh, who should have known better, were for years pushing Mark Driscoll forward, even though his sinful ambition was on full display. he he, he, He didn't make any attempt to hide it, obviously. I was quoting from a sermon. It's perhaps an indication of of just how far we have imbibed the values of the culture rather than the values of Jesus. 
when it comes to pastoral ministry. Listen, friends, pastoral ministry is the platform for one thing, and that's the promotion of Jesus. Uh, There is no place in pastoral ministry for a platform for your significance, your vindication, your identity. It's about the glory of Jesus. It's about the announcement of the good news. It's about the care of your people. It's about evangelizing the lost. It's not about you. And yet there's the Korah factor. There it is. Wanting more influence. Wanting uh, more notice. uh, Wanting more of what that pastor has. So that's the problem. And as I said, no surprise, it's a sin problem. A double-layered sin problem. The sin in our own hearts. The glory-seeking sin in our own hearts. The the sin-shaped cultural values which magnify the sin in our hearts. And that leads us to the tension. Second point, the tension. Uh, And it's in in this point that I'm going to get to this, to, 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 to the subject of the title of today's lecture. And that is the, um, I'm sorry, I got the pulpit mic here. I'm walking away from the pulpit mic. Sorry. Mr. Audiovisual Man, Um, I'm used to the little Madonna mic. Um, This is where I'll get into the the question about uh, excellence. Um, Let me set set the tension up this way. Here's how C.S. Lewis thought about ambition. He says, ambition. We must be careful what we mean by it. It, If it means the desire to get ahead of other people, which is what I think it does mean, then it is bad. If it means simply wanting to do a thing well, then it is good. It isn't wrong for an actor to want to act his part as well as it can possibly be acted, but the wish to have his name in bigger type than the other actors is a bad one. C.S. Lewis is, in his brilliant simplicity, sort of nailed it, I think, right? And our culture doesn't really um, get this at all, right? Because in, in, in our culture, uh, excellence links those two things, right? To, to be excellent means to both do a thing well and getting recognized for it, right? And it's a package deal. Uh, in, in, in the culture. You, 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 you do it well and you get recognized for it. And that's selfish ambition. That's the actor wanting to do his best and get his name in bigger type. Nothing wrong with that, says the culture. But it's that ambition to do something well and to, uh, and to you know, have your name bigger than other, other people, that cultural attitude, that value is, is influencing and undermining the integrity uh, of, of pastoral, faithful pastoral ministry. Right? Um, going back to Eugene Peterson, another piece of wisdom, this was from an interview he did, um, and, and he said this, and I think he's really, really nailed it here. He says, there's no area of the spiritual life that's more subject to pride, to ambition, to self-assertion, to non-humility than leadership positions in ministry. Yet, he goes on, there's no area in which pursuit of excellence is more important either. And I'm sure we would all agree, right, that, that... if, if excellence is, if, if work demands excellence, then pastoral work must certainly demand excellence, right? The stakes are eternally high. But there's the tension, right? How in this culture do you pursue excellence in pastoral ministry and at the same time exercise Christ-like humility, 
Can you be excellent in pastoral ministry and not market yourself in order to promote your identity and magnify uh, the, the influence of your excellent ministry? Well, I would put to you that there's actually, I, I, can, I actually can point to a secular model that does that. Um, and it's from my own, my own life experience, and I go back to my experience practicing law. My law firm, O'Melveny and Myers, e excellence was demanded and expected. Uh, and as a practical matter, Excellence in, 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 in a law firm like that really means legal perfection uh, because the stakes of non-perfection were too high, right? If, if we screwed up a malpractice claim uh, on a uh, uh, transaction, uh, uh, you know, some kind of corporate acquisition worth billions of dollars, or a malpractice claim based on a, on a trial, a case uh, worth billions of dollars where, the, where a company's existence is at stake. If we got, you know, uh, you know if they, they were successful in, in arguing malpractice, that, you know, a judgment on a case of that size would potentially, you know, uh, destroy the firm. And if you individually were the source of the malpractice, Right? Regardless of the firm's fate, your personal future in the firm would definitely be screwed. Right? So, so we worked hard, and we worked as excellently as we could. I mean, that, that ethic was unmistakable in our law firm. But here's, here's the important part. At the same time, our firm's advertising budget was virtually zero. And it was alongside this incredibly powerful ethic of excellence in our work, there was an equally powerful ethic that frowned on overt self-promotion, either individually or corporately as a firm. As quaint as it may sound today, uh, we were expected to act like ladies and gentlemen. And ladies and gentlemen, do not boast about themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, let others boast about themselves, about, about them. Right? Now, does that sound familiar? It's Proverbs 27.2. Right? Let another praise you, not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. See, so by God's common grace, I was part of a law firm made up largely of unbelievers who found themselves committed, albeit unknowingly, to biblical wisdom. And what's crazy is that my law firm was and still is acting more Christianly than a lot of Christians act today. Unbelievers demonstrating excellence in their work and humility in, the, in it without any of the power and without any of the incentives that we have to do the same thing as men and women brought near to God by the blood of Christ. Which brings us to our third and final heading for this morning, which is the correction. So we've got the problem, right? It's a sin problem. As pastors, we have glory-seeking hearts. We are pastoring in a culture that magnifies that our glory-seeking glory heart. We're in, we're, there's a tension in our culture uh, where, where excellence is linked to self-promotion. And, and we have to figure that out. How, how can we link excellence in ministry and, and the humility of Jesus instead of the self-promotion of the culture? That's the tension. Right? So how do you do it? How do you get there? Um, well, the short answer is the one my son learned to give um, long before he went to seminary, but he was still demonstrating theological brilliance as, as a young man when we were trying to do family devotions. And annoyingly, my son's answer to virtually any question I would ask would be Jesus. 
You know, it's always, always sort of a question. Jesus? Right? And knowingly, he was almost always right. Right? Uh, you, parents know if you've tried, you know, the struggle with family devotions. Um, uh, look, uh, there, there's brilliance in that, in that simple answer. It, it's, it's true. Je- Jesus is the answer. As you and I, uh, as pastors, look to Jesus, we will find the way forward that will allow us to say that wherever we are deployed in, in the local church, it's not too small a place for How, so how do we do that? How do we spiritually realign and embrace kingdom values instead of cultural values? I've got five quick suggestions. And these, you know, you could probably think of a lot more, uh, but um, here, here are five. Uh, first, uh, consider the example of Jesus. Now, I know, I know that Jesus is more than an example But he isn't less than an example either. Going back to Wendell Berry, the farmer poet, I was reading an essay about him, and the the poetry critic said something about Wendell Berry that uh, struck me. He says, says, he has embraced the commonplace and has ennobled it. He has embraced the commonplace and ennobled it. Well, If that's an apt description of what Wendell Berry does in his poetry, it seems to me also a pretty apt description of what Jesus Christ definitively did when he came to to planet Earth. He embraced the commonplace and ennobled it. Right? If the Son of God can land in a feed trough in Bethlehem, if he can grow up in poverty... Uh, and be identified his whole life as, as, as an illegitimate child, uh, illegitimate person, uh, with a, from a ridiculed backwater town like Nazareth, if he could do perfect ministry while having no place to lay his head, then we should absolutely expect to find his servants, you and me, doing excellent preaching, excellent scholarship, excellent soul nurturing in the small and unlikely places of the world out of the spotlight a servant is not greater than his master it's a sign of our capitulation to the values of the culture rather than the kingdom that we expect the exact opposite right we 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 are, i'm guessing that most of us think that you know, it's going to be, if you go to the country, you go to the small towns, you go to the small churches, you're going to get less, you know, the, the preaching isn't going to be as good, scholarship isn't going to be as good, discipleship isn't going to be as good. You, you want the excellent stuff, right? Go to New York City, go to Los Angeles. We've, we've surrendered to the culture if we think that way. Francis Schaeffer helpfully reminded us years ago, as as there are no little people in God's sight, so there are no little places. So consider the example of Jesus. Second, use the mind of Jesus, which is already yours, right? I know that Jesus as mere example will crush you. We can't we can't follow his example in any way that it won't crush us. But, but we can follow his example as we think with his mind, as you think with his mind, which is yours already through your participation in the Holy Spirit, right? Philippians 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus already, right? Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard Equality with God, something to be held on to, but emptied himself and took the form of a servant. How do you do that? Well, practical, practical suggestion here. You know, the, 
it's imperative to have a devotional life as a pastor outside of your sermon prep. Now, what I, the, the, uh, the thing that I'm concerned about saying that is, is that I, your sermon prep should be devotional. And your sermon, you should be preaching that sermon to yourself. And you should never see yourself as sort of, you know, merely dispensing truth that your people need that you don't need. All right? Seems my weekly exercise in, in sermon prep is, is typically an exercise in, 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 in uh, guilt. Right? Pre- preaching my own sermon, convicting myself uh, that I need the sermon uh, as much as, if not more than, uh, the people to whom I'm preaching. But the reality is, when, when, you're, when, you're, when you're preparing your sermon, right, there, there, there's, you're necessarily involved in, in a lot of the technicalities of sermon preparation and the, the language and, and thinking through your audience carefully and the needs of your people and, and how you're going to craft the sermon to, to address them and to address the the visiting unbeliever. So there's lots of things on your mind. So in addition to that, I mean, you have a devotional life that outside of the sermon prep, right, independent of your sermon prep. I don't, you know, shape it the way you want. But as long as it allows you to regularly behold the glory of Jesus. Right? And, and the Holy Spirit will then use your beholding of Jesus to renew your mind and transform you into the image of Jesus. That's 2 Corinthians 3.18. Very important passage for me uh, at at New Life. It forms a lot of what we do at New Life, right? It, it, It talks about, you know, behold the glory of the Lord. And as you behold the glory of the Lord, the Spirit will use that to transform you more and more into his image. That's the work of the Spirit. And so I see my job uh, often as a, pa- as, as a pastor is, of course, is, is not, you know, point to myself or, you know, have my people think that I'm brilliant or smart or whatever. I'm pointing to Jesus. I'm wanting them to behold the glory of Jesus because it's in, the, it's in their beholding of the glory of Jesus that they're changed. And it's the same with me. Um, so, so do that. Um, and, and as you do, you, you'll, you will find this, that, that the Spirit will be working against that, that glory, self-glorying part of your heart and will grow you in the humility of Jesus. So consider the example of Jesus. Use the mind of Jesus, which you already have. Third, realize that pastoring is not something you'll ever master. Right? It, this is, I, I, you know, I think some pastors get impatient and get restless and say, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, I've, I'm maxed out here. But I, I don't think you'll ever be in a position to say, yes, I'm, I, you know, I'm sort of done. I've been there, done that. I've mastered it. I'm ready to move up or move on to something bigger and better, a greater challenge. But grief, I mean, it seems to me if you think that, that you, your, your view of God has been shrunken. Right? I've, I've pastored now for over 20 years, and still, every Sunday, uh, I now expect it. It used, to, it used to surprise me, and it used to bother me. Uh, still sort of bothers me, but, it, but at least it doesn't surprise me. Uh, and, and that is that for, for, for 20 years now, virtually every Sunday, I experience afternoon, Sunday afternoon, I experience a kind of spiritual depression. And uh, that depression, as I've, as I've thought about it and prayed about it, seems to, to in my case, to be linked to a, a realization uh, that is renewed every Sunday afternoon, that no matter how poorly or how excellently I preached that morning or administered the sacraments or taught a Sunday school class, that my words even as they were given wings by the Holy Spirit, and I, and I pray for that, and I believe they are, my words still fell so far short of capturing the glory that I was trying to convey. You understand what I mean? It's, I, the, the one th- thing I can c- 
compare it to from my experience at Westminster Seminary. I uh, was, when I was here between 97 and 2000, Meredith Klein was still here. It was, it was in fact, I think, I think his, my last year was his last year of teaching. And uh, so I had him for um, uh, the Pentateuch, uh, ridiculously named class. It's re <laughs> it really should be called, called Genesis 1 through 11. Um, and, uh, and I had him for prophets. And, and I would, you know, I would sit there, you know, and um, you've read his books, so you, so you know, you know Meredith Klein, and, and to hear him lecture was, um, it's kind of like reading his books, you know, you struggle. I'm, I'm, I'm listening, and I'm listening, I'm thinking, and then all of a sudden, I have this, like, breakthrough. It's like, boom. And it, you look at the way his, the, the blackboard looked, the whiteboard, with, with Meredith Klein, it was a complete mess at the end of the hour. And, but, but for like a moment, I'd have these, ep these epiphanies where boom, all of a sudden it's like my mind exploded open and I could, and I could, I was, I got his vision, right? And almost as soon as I'd catch it, it the door would close. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's kind of like that. I mean, I, when I'm preaching or when I'm preparing to preach and when I'm preaching, I catch those, those, those I have those moments of, of, of experiencing and appreciating the beauty of Jesus and I'm, and I'm trying to communicate that, but every Sunday I realize I haven't done it. I, you know, I, I haven't done it. That, um, so it, it, no matter where you're pastoring, you know, there's, there's going to be room for growth. There's always room for, for me, for you to do better, to improve. It's, it's not something you master and move on from. The position of pastor, no matter where you are filling it, no matter how many people are in your church, will always be bigger than you are. The position is bigger than you are. Right? And the fields where we labor are longer than a man's life. Fourth, um, live out of a realistic assessment of who you are. You know, I, hopefully you get this with the mind of Christ, but, but I think the culture uh, tempts us to have uh, a less than realistic view uh, of ourselves. Um, you know, one of the things we've seen a lot lately, tragically, over the last few years especially, is the self-destruction of Christian leaders who... who, who uh, either published way too early or got on the conference circuit, circuit well before their time, and, and they fell, right? And their fall damaged the honor of the church, and it damaged the lives of the people who, who trusted them, right? Now, the, the fact that you've got 20-somethings even thinking that writing books is a good idea is, with, some, with present company accepted among the faculty, um, the, uh, I mean, that's troubling enough, right? That 20 somethings think that they can, uh, in, you know, be writing books. That to me is almost per se indication you don't have a realistic assessment of who you are. But it's even more troubling that Christian publishers, conference organizers, parachurch leaders who should know better. Uh, seem to continue to bow to cultural values and push these leaders forward prematurely, right? If a guy has uh, exceptional gifts, uh, noticeable gifts, he, his ministry is numerically successful, he can sell books, he can make money, uh, he's going to get a platform. That's dicey. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to open a debate about Tim Keller. I know people have different opinions about Tim Keller. I, I don't want to go there. The, you know, the first book Tim Keller wrote was in the 80s, and that was on Mercy Ministry. And that was really a research project. It was a research project for the PCA. So I'm not going to count that book. After that, he, he planted Redeemer Presbyterian Church in in uh, Manhattan, 1989, and once he did that, it wasn't until 2008, 19 years later, that Tim Keller published his first book. 
it's, it seems to me we can learn from one of our elders there, right? There's a time to read and there's a time to write. And w wisdom would say, read now and write later, if at all. If I had written a book about pastoral ministry 19 years in, that would have been just as COVID hit. And if that book, you know, hit, hit the bookshelves uh, at, just as COVID was hitting, I can guarantee you that whatever I would have said in that book would have been worthless. Right? Worthless. I mean, the fact, compared to what we just went through in the last two or three years as a church and as leaders in the church, the difficulties and the challenges that we faced uh, politically, spiritually. Um, and and, I, and I, I, I'm sure you guys are familiar with, with, uh, with this, the kinds of uh, challenges that, that the church has faced in this time. Um, you, you know, I had 18 years of comparative uh, peace. You know, not without its challenges, but but by you know by comparison, it it was like once COVID hit, I I woke up into a different world, uh, and and the challenges were all uh, were, were different and were ramped up, and uh, the the silver lining though of course is about all of this is is the weird but true thing about Christianity is that when we are at our weakest, we are at our strongest. Because when we're weak, then, 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 then Christ can be strong in us. And this has been for me and a lot of pastors a season of weakness, uh, which has made me lean harder on the Lord Jesus. Uh, and I, I would have, I, my, my, I, I believe I, I, I've become a different pastor. I, I believe a better pastor, a more humble pastor. Uh, I hope. Um, so I guess the, the lesson is don't, don't en underestimate life experience, either in yourself or in the people you consult, right? Reading a book from, from a guy without a lot of life experience is probably not worth your time. Get life experience. Right? And then fifth, and very practically, um, and, you know, I, I can already predict the eye rolls as, you know, an old guy is telling you about social media. But, right, you, my, my advice here is just use social media wisely. Yeah, I'm not an expert. I, I know social media is a, is a great tool for a pastor. I use it. I use it primarily as a lurker. Uh, and that sounds creepy. Maybe it is creepy. Uh, <laughs> But that's what I do. I, it, it's, I consult uh, Instagram and Facebook uh, to see what my people are doing, so what my people are saying, what they're thinking, uh, uh, what they're reading. Uh, it's all there on social media. It's a great way to, to um, uh, you know, easily uh, sort of keep tabs on, on what your people are doing and, and where they are. I know, though, at the same time, it is a powerfully tempting platform for self-promotion. And the incessant, humble bragging posts of pastors is not a good look, guys. It's, it, is, it, 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 it ought to be a source of shame for the church. Um, it doesn't look like Jesus. Uh, so be careful with social media. It's... It's, um, it's something that uh, it's, it's, you got to just be very careful with it. So let me close. Uh, I want to close with uh, a, a wise word. It's a, this is an extended quote, but it's, it's worth it uh, from one of our recently departed elders, J.I. Packer. Um, he said, he wrote this. I have found that churches, pastors, seminaries, and parachurch agencies throughout North America are mostly playing the numbers game. That is, defining success in terms of numbers of heads counted or added to those that were there before. In all of this, I seem to see a great deal of unmortified pride, either massaged, indulged, and gratified, 
or wounded, nursed, and mollycoddled. Where quantifiable success is God, pride always grows strong and spreads through the soul as cancer sometimes gallops through the body. Shrinking spiritual stature and growing moral weakness thereby result. And in pastoral leaders, especially those who have become sure they are succeeding, the various forms of abuse and exploitation that follow can be horrific. And boy, we've certainly seen that in the headlines, haven't we? He goes on, orienting all Christian action to visible success as its goal, a move which to many moderns seems supremely sensible and businesslike, is thus more a weakness in the church than its strength. It is a seedbed both of unspiritual vainglory for the self-rated succeeders and of unspiritual despair for the self-rated failures and a source of shallowness and superficiality all around. The way of health and humility is for us to admit to ourselves that in the final analysis, we do not and cannot know the measure of our success the way God sees it. Wisdom says, leave success ratings to God and live your Christianity as a religion of faithfulness rather than an idolatry of achievement. Good word from Jim Packer. Thank you, guys. Let me, let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for uh, this time together. Thank you for the wisdom of our elders. And I pray for my brothers here, either who are already in the pastorate or who are preparing for the pastorate, for the women who are preparing to work in the church. Uh, Lord, we pray that we would uh, be men and women who do our work uh, with excellence, but also do it with a humility that mirrors Jesus. And Lord, in, in our, with our hearts and in our culture, that's hard. It's really hard to do those two things. Um, everything militates against it. Um, so we pray. We pray for strength. We, we pray that um, not just what we say, but how we live and how we measure success and what we value would, would be countercultural in the sense that we would, be, we would be living by kingdom values rather than the values of our, um, our culture of success and of celebrity. So be with us, uh, Father, today and, and uh, Lord willing, in the next two days as we, as we consider these topics and, 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 and consider the, the challenge of humil humility as we seek to serve your church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.